Hello there, I'm Lloyd Evans. Welcome to The Bunker. We're back with the JW Broadcasting episodes. We have an episode for March 2021, which is presented by governing body helper John Ekron. John has decided to speak to his audience, namely all Jehovah's Witnesses who are watching this, on the subject of marriage and the roles of husbands and wives. What's the worst that could happen? Well, Jehovah places the husband as head of the family. A husband is head of his wife. Jehovah placed the woman under the headship of the man. And as such, her role is to be in subjection to him. It can hurt a husband deeply when his wife openly challenges him in front of others. After a long day in service, I had a part to work on. Thankfully, just took care of everything so I could focus on my part. Subjection. Said a certain way, it almost sounds bad. You have to be in subjection. But is the subjection of a Christian wife to a Christian husband a bad thing? No. Did my speech show respect, like Sarah? I needed to tell him how I felt, but I needed to do it the right way. Do you think to yourself, how come they never let her hold him over her head? Well, no, you look at him, you look at her, it's obvious who should hold who over their head. Many times I was musing, well, as a man he could hit me, he could be demanding, you will sit down, you know? But no, he never did that. Men need respect and women need love. Men tend to emphasize respect and status, and women often emphasize intimacy, connection, and love. What though if no adultery has been committed, but for some reason two people who are married to each other just don't like each other any longer? Divorce is not an option. And they always say, I remember my parents in the meeting always say, find someone who loves Jehovah more than he loves you. And it's easy to say that. But as you find someone, you realize she loves Jehovah more than she loves me. And she had demonstrated through her entire marriage. When it comes, Jehovah is first. I think that is the key for a, a successful marriage. Well, wasn't that romantic? So yes, we have no shortage of misogyny and gender stereotyping in this month's episode. Needless to say, we have a lot to discuss. So without further ado... Let's roll the first clip. Jehovah designed marriage as a beautiful and rewarding relationship between a husband and a wife. When a husband and wife fulfill their God-given roles and they treat each other with love and respect, their marriage is a wonderful and intimate friendship. A marriage that has good patterns shaped by Jehovah's principles looks like this well-balanced family circle. But if a married couple over time has set bad patterns in how they deal with each other, this is often the result. Uh, life's going to be a bit rough for them. Yes, governing body helpers do seem to like their props, their visual aids. We've had this before, of course, with Ken Flo Dean and his bizarre bread baking and glass smashing antics. It seems John Ekron wants in on the action with these wheels, or family wheels, as he describes them. Which, I mean, a visual aid doesn't prove your point. It helps you illustrate what you're saying. I've said this before about illustrations. Jehovah's Witnesses are used to seeing and hearing illustrations and actually relying on them to prove their point. But an illustration, again, simply helps you explain what it is you mean. It doesn't make what you're saying true or logical. Anyway, John Ekron is here treating us to a talk all about marriage and the God-given roles of husband and wife. You can see where this is going. We're going to get, again, an awful lot of sexism, misogyny, and gender stereotyping in the talk that's to follow. 
Let's consider what Jehovah says about the roles of husband and wife, and then discuss how love and respect are real keys to a happy marriage. So what roles did Jehovah give to the man and woman in marriage? Well, Jehovah places the husband as head of the family. Ephesians 5.23 says, A husband is head of his wife. So that means the husband makes final decisions for the family. And his decisions will reflect his love for his wife, his children, and his understanding of their spiritual, physical, and emotional needs. At 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 3, we get a sense, though, of how Jehovah feels about the husband's role. And as we read this together, I want you to imagine Jehovah saying to husbands, Yes, you're head of the family, but I want you to know that the head of every man is the Christ, and in turn the head of a woman is the man. Sounds a lot like a father-in-law speaking to the groom. You can marry my daughter, but you better treat her good because you're responsible to me. That's not actually how I read the verse in 1 Corinthians. And by the way, the Apostle Paul was known for his overt sexism in his writings. He repeatedly told women to be silent in the congregation, didn't think they even should be heard from. And that's why Jehovah's Witnesses don't allow women to teach from the platform. The only way you're going to get near a Kingdom Hall platform if you're a Jehovah's Witness woman is if you're cleaning it <laughs> or if you're giving a presentation or experience under the direction of a man. So pointing to 1 Corinthians as this perfectly reasonable outlook I'm not sure I buy into that. First of all, John Ekron is appealing to this idea of fathers somehow having ownership of their daughters so that they pass on this property to their daughter's new husband and everything has to be run through them for their approval, which is itself an extremely sexist and outdated notion. Second of all, if you actually look up 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11, it makes it very clear what the hierarchy is. And no surprises, women are at the bottom of the hierarchy. Let's make no mistake, no matter how John Ekron dresses this up, women get a raw deal <laughs> from this arrangement. So 1 Corinthians 11 verse 2, I commend you because in all things you remember me and you are holding fast the traditions just as I handed them on to you. But I want you to know that the head of every man is the Christ. In turn, the head of a woman is the man. In turn, the head of the Christ is God. So the hierarchy literally goes woman, man, Christ, God. And women are supposed to be thinking, oh yes, it's really considerate the way this has been written. It's written in such a loving way as though it's my dad telling my potential husband to take care of me. Nonsense. This is an archaic, outdated, ignorant, backward piece of ideology that places women firmly at the bottom of the ladder. Well, what about the role of a wife? Jehovah assigned wives as a beloved partner to her husband. And as partners, they can discuss important family matters and work together to make their marriage a success. Jehovah placed the woman under the headship of the man. And as such, her role is to be in subjection to him. At Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, it says, let wives be in subjection to their husbands as to the Lord. Subjection. Said a certain way, it almost sounds bad. You have to be in subjection. But is the subjection of a Christian wife to a Christian husband a bad thing? No. See, subjection, as described in the Bible, is not about being subservient. It's about her role in the marriage. Your partners, each with a beautiful role to fulfill. We could illustrate it with watching a couple ice skating. As they move gracefully across the ice, 
do you think to yourself, how come they never let her hold him over her head? Well, no, you look at him, you look at her, it's obvious who should hold who over their head. Well, just as we admire and respect a woman's role as an ice skating partner, a husband deeply loves and appreciates his wife's role as his partner, as they work gracefully together to make their marriage a success. Wow. (laughs) Where do we even start with this? There's just so much misogyny and gender stereotyping to untangle. It's just not even funny. I don't know whether to feel sorry for John Ekron or outraged because on the one hand, he has this job of talking about marriage, specifically the Bible's view of marriage and the role of husbands and wives in the 21st century. The more the centuries pass from the backward time when the Bible was written, the more outrageous it sounds. And he even says there... Subjection. Said a certain way, it almost sounds bad. Yes, it sounds bad because it is bad, John Ekron. That's not the way it works in a marriage. Maybe in Bible times, in the distant past, the distant, backward, ignorant past, when women were viewed as property and described as such, especially in the Old Testament, maybe in that time, this sort of language would have sounded normal. But we're now in the 21st century, and you're expecting to give this talk, and everyone just nod along as though this sort of language in relation to women is normal. I can't decide whether to feel sorry for you that you've been landed with this material or whether, which I think is more likely, you've chosen this material. I think when governing body helpers or governing body members give talks, usually it will be because there's a particular topic that they want to talk about. So I guess it's difficult to say with any certainty if he has chosen this subject, wow, Shame on him. All he's doing is spewing his own ignorance and just expecting the backward ideology from the Bible to fly in the 21st century when it so clearly doesn't. And in talking about the God-given role of men and women, well, he describes women as partners As I've said before, you can't really call it a partnership, can you? A partnership is when both sides have equal say. That's a partnership. You can't have a partnership when one is being ordered to be in subjection. It's not a true partnership then, is it? And he goes on to discuss the roles, the God-given roles in the marriage with this bizarre illustration of figure skating... Well, there's two obvious things I need to say here. First of all, John Ekron clearly hasn't watched that much figure skating if he thinks there's only ever men lifting women. I researched this because I must admit I'm not a huge fan of figure skating either. I'm sure many are. But it turns out there is such a thing as a reverse lift where the female partner lifts the male partner when figure skating. Here you can see some footage of exactly this happening. So where John Ekron has got this idea that figure skating or lifts performed in figure skating are exclusively men lifting women, how has he come up with this and how has this not been spotted by the many, many teams that this will have had to go through before it's finally reached us on our screens? There will have been writers working on this, researchers working on this, the teaching committee will have signed this off and no one bothered to just say, is that right? Is it true (laughs) that men only ever lift women? and not the other way around. But because John Ekron thinks this, everyone just thinks, well, John must know what he's talking about. This must be a thing, so let's just roll with it, shall we? 
Second of all, his argument doesn't make any sense, even if we grant him that it's only ever men lifting women, which we've just seen evidence that that's not true. But let's just say, for argument's sake, that men have a physiological advantage when it comes to figure skating that makes it easier for them to lift women. Let's go further and say it's easier for men to excel in sports or athletics due to their physiology. That's not what I think. I'm just saying this for argument's sake. What does that have to do with the role of the man and woman in marriage? Why are we dictating relationships and the way human beings treat each other based on their physiology and based on their athleticism and stamina and strength. How does that make any sense whatsoever? That's what John Eckrin is essentially saying here. But can you imagine if a company hired 20 people, they had a recruitment drive, it was a new company, and they went out and they hired 20 people and the CEO of the company said, right, I want us to rank all of our new employees, all of our 20 new employees in terms of their strength, their stamina, their weightlifting abilities and their overall athleticism. And we're going to assign roles within the company based on those physical attributes. <laughs> what company would do that? You would obviously be creating a completely silly leadership structure that gave no attention whatsoever to people's actual leadership skills or the attributes people can bring to the table in terms of teamwork. It would be a stupid thing to do for a company. Why is it suddenly a good thing for families and for marriages to be calibrated in such a bizarre and nonsensical way? But this apparently is the divine standard. And John Eckrin is here to remind Jehovah's Witness couples that this is the way their marriages should work. Each one of you must love his wife as he does himself. On the other hand, the wife should have deep respect for her husband. Well, the obvious message in this scripture is that husbands should love their wives and wives should respect their husbands. However, there's another way to look at this scripture and learn something about husbands and wives. Jehovah God is telling us what each mate needs. Men need respect and women need love. Now, this is not to say that men don't need love and women don't need to be respected. However, it does mean that men tend to emphasize respect and status, and women often emphasize intimacy connection, and love. This does not mean, of course, that men don't need to be loved and women don't need to be respected. We would never make that sort of sweeping generalisation. It's just that men tend to need respect more <laughs> and women tend to need love more. It's a tendency. It's not so much a generalisation. It's just something that... Oh, go on then, it's a generalisation. <laughs> what utter nonsense being disgorged by this guy. He has literally cherry-picked a verse there in Ephesians telling husbands to love their wife as they love themselves and saying, on the other hand, the wife should have deep respect for her husband. And based on this one verse... He's projecting this whole argument that women need love more and conveniently for him, as a man, <laughs> men need respect more. There is, as he repeatedly puts it in this talk, greater emphasis on respect for men and greater emphasis on love for women all based purely on his interpretation 
of Ephesians 5, verse 33, and quite frankly, his opinion. Now, since a wife's emphasis is on being loved, her conversations often stress friendship and connection when she talks to her husband. She's eager to share the details of her life with him and in this way become closer to him. She wants him, in turn, to share with her the details of his day in life. Husbands, your wife feels loved when you learn to communicate with her in a way that tells her you truly care about her. She places great emphasis on conversation and sharing her life with you, and likewise you sharing your life with her. Uh, for example, a wife tells her husband about something that happened to her that day. He grows impatient with the story and interrupts, or changes the subject, or offers a quick solution. How does she feel? Why can't he listen to the whole story? Has he lost interest in me? It's important that husbands give their wives their full attention as they speak. After a long day at work, his mind may be focused on events that happened to him that day. And he may, without realizing it, feel that the events or conversation of his wife aren't on important subjects. So he may be inclined to play down the events in her life as unimportant or trivial, while events he talks about are substantial and important because they happen to him. Well, such a feeling over time can truly discourage a wife. A husband's disinterest in her stories and events of her life feels a lot like disinterest in her. Men, on the other hand, often view conversation differently. A husband comes home and his wife asks, how was your day? He says, it was okay, nothing special. But later that night, when they're with a group of friends, he tells a story about what happened at work. And she wonders, well, why didn't he tell me that when I asked about his day? Well, since a man's emphasis is on respect, they often use conversation to establish respect and status with others. A husband may feel that his wife already respects him, so there's no need to tell her the story. Wives, you can encourage your husband to share his life with you by being interested in his work and activities. If you tell him, don't talk to me about all that work stuff with me, uh, he won't. And you'll cut yourself off from a part of his life. Show him you're proud of what he does to support the family. Be interested in what happened to him, how he feels about things, or challenges that he overcame. While you may not find his work all that interesting, remember, it is important to him. This material is really not going to age well, is it? I mean, it's just a guy, John Ekron, with no special knowledge, no academic qualifications when it comes to sociology or when it comes to psychology, just spewing his ignorant opinions. That's all this is. There is no firm basis, not even in the Bible, for any of this. Again, he's read one verse in Ephesians saying that the wife should have deep respect for her husband and the husband should love his wife. And from this one verse, he's saying, oh, husbands or men, sorry, have a greater emphasis or place a greater emphasis on respect. And women place a greater emphasis on love. So let me give you a whole list of scenarios in which this is true based on my own observations as a man. I'm going to prove to you based on these hypothetical scenarios <laughs> that my opinion regarding this verse in Ephesians is true. And for women, it's all about love. And as he says there, she places great emphasis on conversation. Why does just the woman place emphasis on conversation? John Ekron, you are speaking nonsense. So only women care about conversation. You couldn't have a relationship where a husband is actually more conversational than the woman, could you? Oh no, it has to be the woman that has the emphasis on love and conversation. Whereas for the man, 
it has to be an emphasis on respect and position. He's literally saying this, viewers. I'm not putting words in his mouth. This is the faithful slave's idea of spiritual food at the proper time. Gender roles, sweeping generalizations, and sexist stereotyping. Now, I want you to imagine a husband and wife. They're in a car. They're looking for an address, and they're lost. And the wife suggests that they ask someone for directions. She's thinking, why won't he ask? He's thinking, why can't she just let me find it? You see, since the man's emphasis is on respect, he's trying to avoid looking lost to a stranger. The act of asking someone else for directions may make him feel like he's in a lower position. Finding their way is a challenge to him and he wants to show his wife that he can find it on his own. For the woman, such an idea may not come to mind. She may view it as a simple interchange between them and a stranger. They get help and directions, and they find out where they're going. At 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 33, Jehovah tells us, But the married man is anxious how he may gain the approval of his wife. Wives, your husband is anxious to have your approval and respect. But on balance, husbands have to be careful that an emphasis on respect doesn't become unreasonable. It won't hurt us to ask for directions or help at times. On the other hand, a wife needs to be careful that she doesn't show impatience by her words or tone as her husband works his way through a problem. A wife who clearly understands her husband's desire to solve problems for the family will understand his actions and will do her part to support him even in the little things around the home. Now, this support in the little areas of life builds his confidence in her support and can be a major factor in whether a husband takes the lead in larger matters. Apparently, it's all on wives to support their husbands. It's a one-way thing. <laughs> it's not a mutual thing. And frankly, viewers, so much of what John Eckwin is saying in this talk would make perfect sense if he wasn't singling out women or singling out men. Much of what he's saying is just basic common sense. But when you direct this common sense towards just one party, you immediately skew the whole thing and you frankly reveal your bias. John Ekron is lecturing husbands and wives as a husband, as a man. And quite frankly, it's showing. He was talking just now about the way women or wives need to support their husbands. And he outright says that the level of support a wife gives her husband may dictate the extent to which the husband is able to take the lead or assume authority in larger matters. In other words, if your husband isn't doing well in the organization, isn't a ministerial servant, an elder, doesn't have some kind of super duper privilege on the circuit or even in Bethel, might it be that it's your fault, wives, for holding back your husbands, for not giving them the support you need. If your husband isn't making waves in the organization, could it be that you're to blame? That's what I took from that last little dig. But on the whole, wow, again, just so much misogyny. I was floored when he says, A wife needs to be careful that she doesn't show impatience by her words or tone as her husband works his way through a problem. Quite an intimidating way of putting it, don't you think? You need to be careful, wives. You need to be very careful that you're not impatient by your tone or by your words. Your husband needs to work his way through problems without your impatient interference. This is supposed to be a governing body helper delivering spiritual food on behalf of the faithful slave. This is the attitude that this organization has. 
towards women, towards wives in the organization. They are being singled out. This isn't advice that's being given to both parties in a marriage. Again, it would make sense because this is just common sense, isn't it? Not to be impatient towards someone, to let them figure things out for themselves. It would sort of make sense if this advice were being given to both sides equally. But when you single out one side as a man, if you're singling out women and saying, don't be so impatient, women, be careful that your tone and your words aren't impatient. What you're essentially saying is women or wives have a problem. And that problem is that they don't support their husbands by being impatient through their tone or through their words. Have you ever seen a couple where one of them is telling a story and the other is constantly correcting the details? Or the husband is trying to give some direction and the wife corrects or challenges the direction? Or the husband is telling others some unflattering story that hurts his wife's feelings? How can Ephesians 5.33 help a wife in these situations? Well, since a husband's emphasis is on respect, he'll be much more sensitive to comments his wife may make in front of others. It can hurt a husband deeply when his wife openly challenges him in front of others. Proverbs chapter 31 and verse 12 has this advice for wives. She rewards him with good, not bad, all the days of her life. So when in public or when others are around, even close family and children, Try not to openly disagree with him, correct him, or attempt to take over what he's doing. How you speak to your husband in front of others is a great way to show your deep respect for him. It also builds respect for him and others, including any children in the family. Now, the best time to bring matters to each other's attention is when you're in private, or if needed, when you can talk in such a way that others cannot hear what's being said. In this way, a wife shows deep respect for her husband, and the husband shows his love for his wife. Well, we're learning all about what a partnership is in the context of a Jehovah's Witness marriage, aren't we? Not really a partnership, is it? Again, if it's a partnership, both sides are equal, and both sides have the right to give input, have the right to weigh in on the situation irrespective of whether they're in public or in private, but because it's not really a partnership, because women are supposed to be in subjection to men in a Jehovah's Witness marriage, women need to watch what they say. They need to bite their tongue. They need to be mindful of their husband's feelings, of the husband's emphasis on respect. Again, all of this, all of what we're hearing right now is based on John Ekron's reading of Ephesians 5, verse 33, which simply says, each one of you must love his wife as he does himself. On the other hand, the wife should have deep respect for her husband. It literally just says, husbands, love your wives. Wives, respect your husbands. Again, kind of a skewed emphasis there on respect for the husband. But what this verse doesn't say, does not say, is that there is a greater emphasis on respect for men and a greater emphasis on love for women. And this dictates everything in a marriage. That's what John Ekron is reading into this verse to the point where he's now projecting this idea that women need to be careful what they say around their husband and they're not allowed to openly challenge their husband or, in other words, contradict their husband if they're in the presence of other people. Just bizarre that he thinks that this sort of thing will wash Again, in the 21st century, 
when, okay, we may not have full gender equality, but we're certainly further along in that respect than we were in, say, the 1950s, when what John Ekron is saying would have sounded more normal. It's not normal, John Ekron. What you're spouting is utter gibberish based purely on your own opinions and observations. And when he cites Proverbs 31, she rewards him with good, not bad, all the days of her life. He's referring, of course, to the passage in Proverbs about the capable wife. And I've already spoken about this in my rebuttal to the Always Rejoice convention because they brought up the verses on the capable wife when they were giving advice or instruction to women during the convention. I pointed out that the sexism and misogyny is on open display in that verse in particular. What it says in Proverbs 31 regarding the capable wife is her sons have risen up and pronounced her happy. In other words, if you want to be capable as a wife, you'd better bear children. That's your role as a woman or as a wife. You need to procreate. You need to produce offspring for your husband. That's the sort of thinking, that's the sort of backward ideology that John Ekron is appealing to here. A good marriage is hard work. How was your marriage? Would you say that you've developed good patterns or bad patterns in dealing with each other? When was the last time you talked as a couple about love and respect for each other? Jehovah's perfect advice at Ephesians 5.33 can help the marriage of two imperfect people. In just a few words in this verse, Jehovah's sharing with us a key principle of how he designed marriage. He's telling us what each needs and places emphasis on. Husbands put emphasis on being respected, and wives put emphasis on being loved. And this principle forms a key part of the divine pattern for marriage. If you want your marriage to operate as Jehovah designed, then work hard to apply his perfect principle of love and respect in your marriage. You can wave wooden wheels at us all you want, John Ekron. It doesn't make your points valid. It doesn't make your ridiculous monologue any more coherent. You keep talking about this divine principle of greater emphasis on respect for men and greater emphasis on love for women, again, based purely on a verse that says, husbands love your wives, wives respect your husbands. It doesn't say anything at all about men in general placing a greater emphasis on respect and women in general placing a greater emphasis on love. Isn't it kind of convenient for you as a man John Ekron, if that's the case, if men get to have the respect <laughs> and women just get to have the love, doesn't that work out well for you? Wouldn't this be a little bit more compelling if it were a woman saying this based on her observations? Oh yes, I, I prefer to be loved as a woman. I'm not so bothered about being respected. That's essentially what he's saying repeatedly, all based on his interpretation, his male-centric interpretation of Ephesians 5, verse 33, he also says, When was the last time you talked as a couple about love and respect for each other? That's the sort of guilt-tripping question that you could sneak into any talk, isn't it, to try and make your point towards the end. And the audience will be sitting there thinking, oh, he's got a point there. It's been a while since me and Deirdre sat down and had a conversation about the need for love and respect. If Deirdre does sit down with you, if your spouse, I don't know why I've picked the name Deirdre, if your spouse does sit down with you and, and says, Kevin, 
it's time we have a conversation about the need for love and respect in our marriage. <laughs> you know you're in for a difficult conversation, don't you? Again, he's creating this unlikely scenario that's only really going to happen if things are really bad, let's face it. And he's putting this in there so that Jehovah's Witness husbands and wives who are watching this will be thinking, John Equin's got a point there. Damn it. We've not had a conversation about this for a while. Therefore, all of what he's saying must apply to us. We must be failing in some way. We need to be careful because we're letting things slide on this issue, even though they might have a perfectly fine marriage where they haven't had to discuss love and respect because the love and respect is there, irrespective of what it says in Ephesians 5 verse 33, or John Ekron's interpretation of what it says in Ephesians 5 verse 33. Again, this is all just John Ekron projecting his backward, misogynist, narrow-minded views on millions of Jehovah's Witness husbands and wives. Why can we be confident that Bible principles for husbands and wives work? Because they've worked for Jehovah's people in the past. In the following dramatization, notice what wives and husbands can learn from the example of Sarah. Pioneering where the need is greater wasn't easy. After a long day in service, I had a part to work on. Thankfully, Jess took care of everything so I could focus on my part. She's the best. Poor thing. She was exhausted. Good thing we were turning in early. William and I couldn't agree on much lately. We couldn't afford this. There had to be something cheaper. But he wouldn't listen. Sometimes, I feel my husband doesn't make the best decisions. I just wish he'd value my suggestions. Frankly, I've given up trying. So we're now watching a dramatization highlighting the Bible character Sarah, as in Abraham and Sarah, we start off with this young couple pioneering where the need is greater and he's obviously very preoccupied with his role in the congregation. It's again portraying a very stereotyped view of what a marriage should be, isn't it? Showing him focused on his congregation duties while the wife loyally slaves in the kitchen to make the meal. Oh, Jess, she's the best <laughs> for making this meal just so I can sit there at the table doing my meeting preparation. Incidentally, it's not really condemned for him to do this as we go on and see the rest of this dramatization. It turns out he needs to be more mindful of Jess's needs by taking her to the restaurant occasionally but apparently there's nothing wrong in him doing essentially what he was doing, doing his meeting preparation at the dining table 
with his wife sat across from him having prepared this meal, which is apparently her job. It's her role, isn't it? We're learning all about roles in this JW Broadcasting episode and how apparently all the crummy roles <laughs> fall to the woman. And then you have this couple where the guy is looking at expensive cameras. I should say the guy's name is William. William's looking at expensive cameras and his wife is exasperated because she is clearly pointing out that they can't afford the camera that he's buying and he won't listen to her. That's the problem they have in that particular marriage. It's not that she has any issue speaking out when she needs to say something. It's that her husband won't listen. But as the dramatization continues, we're going to find that actually it's not William's fault. It's not the husband's fault for being apparently inept at handling the household finances. It's her fault for not being assertive enough. Sarah was willing to move to parts unknown. A life fraught with danger and hardship. She unselfishly supported Abraham, no matter what. Just like my Jessica. She does without, never complains. What a gem. I can do better, letting her know just how precious she is to me. Sarah submissively obeyed her husband, but she also spoke up. She loved her son, and she knew what was at stake. God's promises through Isaac. Even though she knew it would upset Abraham, she spoke up. She must have thought carefully before speaking to him. After all, she called him Lord. Jehovah blessed her for her loyal support of Abraham, even reminding him to listen to her. I knew I couldn't expect Jehovah to whisper in my husband's ear. But did my speech show respect, like Sarah? I needed to tell him how I felt, but I needed to do it the right way. Yes, it's all her fault, apparently. She was right about the camera. She was right to remind her husband that they couldn't afford that particular piece of tech and that they needed to be more careful with their finances. She just wasn't respectful enough. She just wasn't as subservient as she ought to be because, after all, when Sarah was talking to Abraham, Sarah called Abraham Lord. <laughs> That's the sort of language that's expected of you if you're a Jehovah's Witness wife. You need to imitate Sarah. <laughs> kind of kinky, isn't it? You need to imitate Sarah and call your husband Lord or otherwise show 
your respect for your husband. You can't just state your mind plainly. Everything has to be laced with this heavy appreciation for his role in the marriage and acknowledgement of your subservient role. That's the message I took from that part of the dramatization. They seem to be basing it, by the way, on Genesis 21. There's a story in Genesis 21 where Sarah gives birth to Isaac, and then there's tension between Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael was the son of Hagar and Abraham. It was totally messed up, viewers. <laughs> Jehovah's Witnesses who are watching this might be vaguely familiar with the story. It's another example of how the morals in the Bible simply don't square up with the morals that are frankly expected of Jehovah's Witnesses today. But there came a point in Genesis earlier on where Sarah basically told her husband to have sex with her maidservant Hagar because she wasn't able to bear a child. The solution was well you have sex with my maidservant Hagar that way there will at least be progeny for you because I'm failing in my wifely duties <laughs> when it comes to childbearing at this at least this way you will have a son abraham takes sarah's advice and practices polygamy <laughs> which apparently is okay under certain circumstances inevitably a child comes on the scene ishmael but when sarah eventually has a child of her own isaac also, inevitably, there's friction between Sarah and Hagar, and Sarah takes an extremely dim view of both Hagar and Ishmael. Isaac and Ishmael have fallings out. It says in Genesis 21 verse 9, but Sarah kept noticing that the son of Hagar, the Egyptian, whom she had borne to Abraham, was mocking Isaac. Oh dear, not mocking Isaac. How awful. That's in fact unforgivable. <laughs> if Ishmael is mocking Isaac, what needs to happen, quite frankly, viewers, is Abraham needs to disfellowship Hagar, his second wife, or however many wives it was, his wife and his child Ishmael, he needs to disfellowship them from the family and basically send them packing on Sarah's instructions. And that's what happens. And that's the story that's alluded to here. It's interesting that they don't spell the story out. They just give you this vague depiction of it without you really knowing what's happening. But when you read Genesis 21... I'm sorry, viewers, this is a messed up story and not something that should be pointed to in the 21st century as a model of how families ought to conduct themselves. On the other side of the dramatization, of course, you have the couple of pioneers who are serving where the need is great. He had previously been lacking in appreciation for Jess, who had been performing her wifely role of loyally being in subjection and preparing meals for her husband, only for her husband to sit at the table and be more interested in preparing his talk. Because, of course, kingdom interests always come first. As we're going to see later on in this JW Broadcasting episode, Jehovah comes first in the marriage. So that sort of behaviour is actually quite excusable. But it's interesting that he says regarding Jess, his wife, She does without, never complains. What a gem. Well, there's the take-home message for Jehovah's Witness wives. If you're in a marriage and you happen to be female, you need to bear in mind that you should never complain. You should just go about your wifely duties and make sure that you live up to your husband's expectations.
I was baptized on August 1946 at Cleveland, Ohio. I started pioneering in January of 1947. Well, there are a couple of scriptures that have been most influential in my life. One in Psalm 55, 22, which says, throw your burden on Jehovah and he will sustain you. Never will he allow the righteous one to fall. One of the most trying experiences of my life was facing the Selective Service Board. I registered as was required by law, and I received the classification of 1A, fit for military service. I then spoke with the society's legal department, and I was instructed to appeal the decision because I was a regular pioneer. I had to go to the draft board, and there I was severely questioned one of the problems they had was that I had a part-time job, and they felt that that interfered with my being classified as a full-time minister. However, because I was conducting about 12 Bible studies at that time, I took copies of all those records and presented it to the board. The chairman said to me, are you saying if we were to talk to all of these people, they would tell us that you're conducting Bible study with them every week, and I said, yes, sir. While they are deliberating, I am praying hard to hope help them to make a proper decision. In a few days' time, the classification card came as 4D. I was classified as a religious minister, and I lift my thought to Jehovah, and thank you, Jehovah, very much. So we're now hearing the story of Claudius Johnson, a Jehovah's Witness who is pioneering deep into his 90s. He is giving us his life story as a Jehovah's Witness. And I'm afraid it's another example of them just choosing someone to give their life story based on their credentials or based on their track record of faithful service rather than based on their story being interesting. I'm sorry if you're watching this as someone who's never been a Jehovah's Witness and you're confused as to the relevance of this story and you're perhaps thinking maybe this story is more interesting than it sounds. No, I'm with you. This is an intensely dull story. Claudius is here telling us about one of the most challenging experiences he has faced in his life. The music that's played and the way certain scenes are shot in reenacting all of this has the look and feel of some kind of espionage drama. <laughs> but this is literally just about him ducking military service because he's one of Jehovah's Witnesses. That's all this is. No one dies. <laughs> no one even comes close to dying or being injured. There isn't anything of any real interest other than a Jehovah's Witness who's desperate to get out of serving in the military and he manages to convince the authorities that he should be exempt from military service because he is pioneering as one of Jehovah's Witnesses and has a number of Bible studies. That's the story. And apparently the fact that he had things his way and the authorities yielded and gave him exemption from military service, this shows some sort of intervention by God in Claudius's life. This is proof, apparently, that God was looking out for him. And when I was in the circuit work in Cuba, I had a few encounters with soldiers. It's difficult to understand the tense atmosphere that existed back in those days, the freedom that those rebels had with shooting people and even Batista's people. They didn't have a second thought. I had just got through serving a congregation in the hills and we took the local bus that ran around that area and on the highway, two soldiers stopped the bus and ordered all men to come off. 
They start looking at each of us one by one, sending everybody back on the bus, and they looked at me and said, you, stay there. Pointed a rifle at me and said, who are you? And I explained myself, but they kept pointing the rifle. One of the soldiers said to the driver, take off. But that's when you pray hard. And you remember the scripture, Proverbs 29, 25. Trembling at men is a sneer, but the one trusting in Jehovah will be protected. So the driver said, no, he's a circuit overseer. He rides with me all the while. And he really defended me and makes me believe that Jehovah's angels intervene. And that's why I say I am a slave to prayer. It's the most important thing in my life. Well, this is certainly a more interesting story than the selective service story that he was telling us before. We actually do have a threat to life in this situation because someone is pointing a rifle at Claudius and he gets out of that situation. But even though the circumstances are more dramatic, I'm still not persuaded by Claudius's claim that this is some kind of proof of divine intervention, indeed of angelic intervention, no less. It couldn't just be a case of the bus driver liking him, being mates with him, standing up for him, and these military officers standing down because they'd been persuaded by this bus driver that Claudius wasn't a threat and was a friend of his. He could vouch for Claudius. Therefore, they needed to let Claudius off the hook. No, no. This was proof, apparently, of angelic intervention. God wasn't interested in saving the lives of others. He wasn't interested in intervening during the Holocaust. He wasn't interested in sparing the lives of Jehovah's Witnesses in countries like Malawi, where witnesses were murdered or were treated grotesquely by the authorities there due to taking a stand. Jehovah couldn't be bothered to come to the rescue of those people, but Claudius is special, at least in his mind. This goes to what I've been saying recently on the channel it's a huge problem I have with this whole idea of an interventionist God. Once you start making claims that God is intervening to your benefit in your life, getting you off the hook in whatever situation, you then have to explain why God is so indifferent to more pressing issues and more clear cases of injustice, you need to explain, if you're pushing this idea of an interventionist God, why this interventionist God has such terrible prioritization skills. Are you married to someone who doesn't serve Jehovah or is even opposed to the truth? You'll appreciate the experience of Alexandru and Darina Vakar. I started to study the Bible in 1993. At that time, I was 43 years old. I was married for 19 years and I had two children. At that time, I didn't know if I would become one of Jehovah's Witnesses or not, but I accepted a Bible study. At my husband's request, I started studying the Bible at the same time, but I only studied for about a year. Then I decided I'm going to stop. I asked him to stop studying too. I told him, let's stop studying, this is not for us, we don't understand it. But in a very diplomatic and calm way, he said he would continue. When I realised he would continue studying, I said to myself, well, all right then, just you wait and see. If you really want to continue, I will somehow make you stop studying. In a subtle way, but I will do it. Just seeing him get ready to go in the field service annoyed me so much. I started burying him with household chores, asking him to help me more and more around the house. But calmly and gently, every time he would ask me if he could prepare for meetings. And one time when he asked me if he could prepare for the meeting, yet again I got irritated and said, you're not going to prepare now. We're going to clean the whole apartment thoroughly. 
after we were finally finished at midnight, he asked me very calmly if there was anything else he could help me with. It was not easy for him to deal with my efforts to force him to stop studying. And after he got baptized, I tried even harder. During this period, he often told me how much he loved me. Many times, yes, very often. And sometimes he would ask me if I loved him too. There were times when I would answer him. And there were times when I just smiled and said nothing. There's no other way to put it, viewers. I think what's being described here is a toxic, controlling relationship. This is not the way a spouse ought to react when their husband or wife is getting involved with a religious group. Just start trying to manipulate them, trying to force their behavior by unnecessarily weighing them with tasks that don't need doing. Hopefully this lady doesn't behave in this way anymore, but quite frankly there are no guarantees. But the apparent message seems to be this is the sort of thing you can expect from worldly people before they become Jehovah's Witnesses. If you have a spouse who is opposed to the truth, this is the sort of underhanded stuff they will get up to they will overburden you with tasks that don't need doing and they will emotionally manipulate you by refusing to reciprocate your expressions of love. Hearing her criticisms, those harsh replies, I thought sometimes, I think I'll just give up. It makes no sense to go on like this. I said to the brother who was studying with me about this, I want to stop. And he encouraged me. He said, no, 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 don't stop. Don't quit. Continue, continue. Probably your wife will follow you. These conversations always encouraged me. And when we were finished our study, I would see things from a different perspective. I'm sure you did. So this is interesting. This guy was literally saying to the Jehovah's Witness who was studying with him, I want to stop. He wanted to stop the study and the guy who was studying with him was essentially coercing him to continue so that by the time these studies would end, he felt reinvigorated and he felt prepared to go back into this situation where his wife was opposed to what he was doing and it clearly didn't make enough sense to him if he was at a point where he was half-hearted about it to begin with. Either it's the truth or it isn't the truth. If it's the truth and you're convinced by it, you wouldn't even consider the idea of giving up on it, would you? Because it's the truth. But the very fact that he came to the point where he seriously considered stopping the study to the point where he said to his study conductor, I want to stop, tells you that he was going through this phase of indoctrination and he was at a point in that phase where he knew it wasn't for him, but he was being pushed. He was being pushed by the witness who was studying with him to continue, even though it was putting a strain on the marriage. I was impressed by his kindness. I was very impressed. Many times I was musing, well, as a man, he could hit me. He could be demanding, you will sit down, you know? But no, he never did that. He never raised his voice, never spoke a mean word, never. When she saw that I did not retaliate, as in I would not reply harshly and I would not talk badly to her, then eventually she would calm down. In his calm and mild way, he began inviting me to the meetings. He kept on inviting me and sometimes I was willing to accept. Slowly, I started to attend the meetings. I was happy. I was very happy when she said she wanted to resume her study. In August 2006, I started studying the Bible again. And in March 2007, I became an unbaptized publisher. 
and in July 2007, I decided to get baptized. I served in the baptism department and I had the privilege to personally baptize my dear wife. First Corinthians 13, 4 says that love is patient and kind. Patience means, first of all, being patient for months, years, or maybe even decades. Never give up. Never consider someone as a lost cause. Even though Alexandru and Dorina's marriage was far from ideal for a long time, Alexandru didn't lose his patience. He was calm and loving. That promoted peace, and eventually it moved Arena to embrace the truth. If you have an unbelieving mate, remember Alexandru's example. And as he said, never give up. I think this is actually irresponsible advice for John Ekron to be giving Jehovah's Witnesses in this particular situation. And I think this emphasizes the whole problem with manipulating witnesses with these heart-tugging testimonials. What they're doing is they're taking a situation, they're taking a story where things worked out well, where there was a happily ever after, and they're essentially telling witnesses, do what these people did if you're in similar circumstances and it's all just going to magically work out well for you. Well, that's not quite how it works, is it? Every person is different. Every relationship is different. You can't simply take one story and argue logically, it worked out well here, it's therefore going to work out well if you follow the course of action that these people took. But unfortunately, it's precisely the heart-tugging, tear-jerking testimonials that are really going to hook Jehovah's Witnesses in. I think that when it comes to these JW Broadcasting episodes in particular, most of the material is silly or hints strongly at a man-made organisation that's being steered by opinions rather than genuinely what's in the Bible. But witnesses will be sitting through the JW Broadcasting episodes thinking, I'll hang on for the testimonials. Those are the bits that I can relate to. Those are the bits that I find compelling. I want to see my brothers and sisters from different parts of the world. I want to see examples of people overcoming adversity. In this case, the adversity was you had a toxic relationship where the wife was being emotionally manipulative towards her husband. This was not a healthy relationship by any stretch. And they replaced their toxic relationship with being together in a cult. That somehow has fixed things we're being led to assume. And we're also being led to assume, or Jehovah's Witnesses are being led to assume, that this is the sort of behavior they can expect from marriage mates who are opposed to the religion. This is the sort of underhanded, shady tactics that an unbelieving spouse will resort to, just inventing jobs to keep you busy so that you can't prepare for the meetings. So not only is it normalizing extremely toxic behavior, it's also sending a message that essentially demonizes unbelieving partners. And I hope you noticed the part where the wife just blurts out. Many times I was musing, well, as a man, he could hit me. He could be demanding. You will sit down, you know. As a man, he could hit me. Where did that come from? That's like saying, as an adult, he could purchase a shotgun and shoot me. (laughs) 
Yes, he has the ability to hit you, but why is he in any way justified doing that? Or why is this something you even need to talk about just because he's a man? It's one of those situations where the interview subject is entitled to relate their story honestly, and it could be that this lady lives in a culture or has grown up in a culture where it's normal for men to hit women. But I think that the producers of this particular segment ought to have taken some journalistic license here and edited that part out because you don't want to be sending a message that it's normal for men to hit women if things go wrong or if things get too emotional. If you are the sort of man, the sort of monster who would hit women, and let's say you're a Jehovah's Witness and you're watching this testimonial, what message will you take away from this? You're going to be thinking, oh yes, my inclination to hit my wife is normal because we've just heard this lady on a JW broadcasting episode say that this was her expectation. Especially when you have a group with such a deplorable policy when it comes to domestic violence. We're talking about a group that says there is never a grounds to leave a marriage, to divorce your spouse other than adultery. And we're going to hear this emphasised elsewhere in this very JW Broadcasting episode. This is a religion that endangers abused spouses by telling them there's no grounds for you to get out there's no grounds for you to escape this abusive relationship unless your spouse commits adultery. You need to stay in the marriage and somehow make it work, especially when you have a group with that kind of grotesque, backward, abusive ideology. It's deplorable that they should be including testimony, genuine or not, that normalizes abusive behavior so that if you happen to be an abusive spouse, you can be watching this, nodding along, thinking, my behavior is perfectly normal. Ecclesiastes chapter 4 and verse 12 speaks of a threefold cord that cannot quickly be torn apart. That's often applied to Christian marriage. But what does that threefold cord mean? And how does it make a marriage successful? We'll learn the answers in our next segment. So it was summertime, a group of, of um, brothers and sisters, we made arrangements to during the vacation time to go to the beach and so during that time, heading to the beach is where I met her. I had met her sisters, but I had not met her. My grandparents and my aunt were a very important part in raising me and my sisters. They learned the truth first in Ecuador, and we always lived co close by. We, you know, we all, I always went to visit them, and they helped my parents in guiding me into the truth. So first, Three or four years of our marriage, we were about an hour and a half away from my family, and that was really hard on me. Because uh, I'm close to my sister, so it was kind of hard being so far. To me, that was really far. <laughs> I knew early on that one of the most important things that I needed in a mate is someone who loved Jehovah. And they always say, I remember my parents in the meeting always say, find someone who loves Jehovah more than he loves you. And it's easy to say that. But as you find someone, you realize she loves Jehovah more than she loves me. And she had demonstrated through her entire marriage. When it comes, Jehovah is first. I think that is the key for a, a successful marriage. Just utterly cringeworthy material here, all of which will be perfectly normal or should be perfectly normal to Jehovah's Witnesses who are watching this. Bear in mind, this is all about the threefold cord Anyone who's been to a Jehovah's Witness wedding will understand that this is a key tenet of 
Jehovah's Witness marriages and Jehovah's Witness weddings, this idea that when you get married to someone, it's not just the two of you, you're woven into this cord <laughs> with Jehovah. Jehovah has to be in your marriage. If you think about it, it's kind of this weird celestial threesome <laughs> where you have this invisible person involved in your relationship who should be the most important person in your relationship even though you can't see him and everything that he thinks and all of his expectations for you are being dictated by an organization so really it's not a threefold cord with jehovah in your relationship it's a threefold cord with jehovah's organization in your relationship meaning the governing body the governing body make up the third part of the threesome if you think about it and it was especially cringeworthy to hear this couple just outright say oh yes jehovah's totally more important than my partner or in this case the husband was saying i know that jehovah is more important to my wife than i am i know that my wife loves jehovah more than she loves me it's one thing to have this as kind of a hypothetical scenario or something that jehovah's witnesses should aspire to but I don't think I've ever seen before a couple just outright say, oh, yes, I know I play second fiddle to Jehovah in our marriage, which when it all boils down to it really means I play second fiddle to the religion. The threefold chord is the routine in which Jehovah is included in the marriage. From reading the Bible together to going in the ministry together to doing everyday things together and as you do this jehovah is present in your marriage but we always think that it's our bible reading actually we don't think we realize yeah. our bible reading is very important for us we pick a book we start reading it and we know that is what keeps us together we were both already pioneering before we got married and uh, as we got married we just figured out a way to continue pioneering together um, just make sure to start our spiritual careers together. So we have to always depend on Jehovah, which is the best person to always depend on. Because it's three of us and Jehovah is an equal part in our marriage, it doesn't matter what we go through, whether it be Peter or I that's having a little bit of a struggle because Jehovah is there, it's gonna keep us united and strong. And also, it's not just in the things we do while we worship. Yes, we worship together but it's also all the other things that we do Jehovah's way. When husbands and wives are united with Jehovah, their marriage is as strong as that threefold cord. Is that so, John Ekron? Well, I think I would take a different message from this. I would take the message that there is this weird celestial threesome <laughs> arrangement going on which again isn't really celestial. It has nothing to do really with God. It has everything to do with an organization. What I'm seeing here are couples, and by the way, I haven't commented on the fact that these are three fleshly sisters who married three fleshly brothers. That's weird, isn't it? <laughs> This just screams to me that there was a very limited pool of potential partners when all of these people were at the time in their lives where they were looking to get into a relationship to the point where you just basically had two families merging, which is what's being described here. But going back to this freaky, uh, kind of kinky threesome situation... <laughs> It's not really celestial. It's not really divine. God has no part in this. It's all about the organization. And the threefold cord is just another way of saying, make sure your religion comes first in your marriage, in your relationship, in your family. 
And I can't see how this would benefit a marriage, which is what John Ekron says at the end there. Oh, this is going to strengthen your relationship. Everything's going to be great so long as you keep Jehovah front center. No, what's going to happen is if either spouse wakes up to the fact that they're in a cult, it's going to kill the marriage. Because the other spouse, if they take this advice seriously, will, as we've seen shown very vividly in these testimonials, they will view Jehovah as more important than their spouse. That's how witnesses are being trained to think in this bizarre material. So that losing one's faith is the end, essentially, of your marriage. This in no way strengthens a relationship. If anything, this undermines a relationship and it gets even more tragic, obviously, if you have children involved, because exactly the same mentality applies in a family arrangement with children. No matter how much you think you love your child, if your child ever strays from the religion and they're old enough to leave home, you should get rid of them. Because Jehovah comes first, not just in your marriage, but in your family. As Jesus said, God created male and female, two complementary genders, and he yoked them together in marriage as one flesh. Now, it's interesting what the Bible exposition commentary says about this. God established marriage, and therefore only God can control its character. It is a union between one man and one woman. God did not create two men and one woman, two women and one man, two men or two women. Group marriages, gay marriages, and other variations are contrary to the will of God. No matter what some psychologists and jurists may say, no court of law can change what God has established. And those are comments we can agree with. I'm sure you can agree with them, Robert Saranko. <laughs> so Robert Saranko is here making a cameo in the March 2021 JW Broadcasting episode, this is a morning worship talk that we're being treated to. On this occasion, he's talking specifically about marriage and the fact that husband and wife become one flesh. He's quoting from a Bible commentary, in other words, not a Jehovah's Witness publication, a publication that has been produced by theologians or Bible scholars. If a book like that were to say anything that Jehovah's Witnesses disagree with or Jehovah's Witnesses don't teach, that part would just be disregarded. But <laughs> if it says something that Robert Saranko or Jehovah's Witnesses agree with, oh, we'll quote from this, we'll quote from just this part in our morning worship, and that will give our views, that will give our opinions, our interpretation of the scriptures more weight. Very disingenuous the way they use external sources so selectively to bolster their ideas. In this case, homophobic, bigoted ideas against gay marriage. What we've just heard here is just another spin on the tired old trope of, oh, in the Garden of Eden, there wasn't Adam and Steve, it was Adam and Eve. That's essentially all this Bible commentary source is saying nothing in any way intellectually stimulating no logical coherent argument against homosexuality or against gay marriage this book which robert saranko is using to bolster his backward views and the organization's backward views is based purely on an ancient text that literally calls for gay people to be executed. Leviticus 20, verse 13. That's the sort of degraded, bigoted, intolerant, extreme ideology that Robert Saranko and, by extension, the faithful slave are invoking. 
Well, sad to say, many people these days take a very casual attitude toward marriage. And when the relationship becomes strained, they just give up and walk out on their mate. But that is not the Christian way. Marriage is to be a lifelong relationship. Just a few verses later on in Matthew 19, verse 9, Jesus taught that the only scriptural ground for dissolving marriage is when an innocent mate chooses not to forgive an adulterous partner. And that is because sexual relations outside the marriage bond are a gross perversion of the one flesh union. Now let's read Paul's words about this at 1 Corinthians chapter 6. He said, Do you not know that anyone who is joined to a prostitute is one body with her? For the two, says he, will be one flesh. So the adulterer pulls away from his marriage mate and makes himself one flesh with a third person. That then is the only scriptural basis for divorce. But divorce is a very painful experience. As one sociologist put it, divorce is drastic surgery. Uh, to sever the one flesh bond between husband and wife would be like sawing oneself asunder. What though if no adultery has been committed? If for some reason, two people who are married to each other just don't like each other any longer. Divorce is not an option. Instead, they need to remind themselves of what attracted them to each other and work at rekindling those feelings while at the same time looking to Jehovah for help in not only strengthening their marriage, but also their spirituality. So again, Robert Suranko here, a helper to the governing body, making a cameo in the March 2021 JW Broadcasting episode, and he is regurgitating one of the most dangerous, obnoxious, grotesque aspects of Jehovah's Witness theology, especially pertaining to marriage. This idea that once you get married to someone, no matter how abusive they are, no matter how violent they are, no matter how toxic they are, you're stuck with them. You are stuck with them for life. The only way you can get out of that situation is if one of you commits adultery. And obviously, you don't need me to tell you that there are any number of scenarios in which a husband or wife, because it doesn't have to be just husbands, in which a husband or wife are violently abusive and there is no adultery in the marriage. And in those situations, well, as Robert Saranko puts it there, divorce is not an option. That's the advice. That's the divine wisdom from the faithful slave for any situation in which there is a, a violently abusive spouse who could be endangering someone's life and the abused spouse, the one who's on the receiving end of this treatment, is just supposed to put up with it and think, oh, I need to work on fixing this. This is actually, in a way, my fault. I should be trying to rekindle my feelings for this person who is abusing me. It's all on me. There's no option for me to escape this situation and move on with my life, find someone who isn't abusive towards me, because now I've married this person who, for all we know, they could have got married when they were both young and naive, bearing in mind there's no sex before marriage. This forces young Jehovah's Witnesses into situations where they get married young because that's the only way they can have any sex as young people. So there will be any number of marriages, there will be any number of husbands and wives watching this advice where they're just hopelessly ill-suited to the person they're stuck with. The person who in many cases, or in at least in some cases, will be abusive towards them and again, Robert Saranko's wisdom here is to say, tough luck, you're stuck with each other, figure out a way of making it work, figure out a way of rekindling your love for your abuser. When a husband and wife apply Bible principles, their marriage endures. 
and is successful. And we'll see that in our new music video. You're the one, the only one for me. You're my love, my one and only. Your qualities, your faith, they bring me such the Let's just say it, shall we? Jehovah's Witness love songs really, really suck. I mean, what was that? I guess I'm sort of immune to the cringe at this point. Almost every JW Broadcasting episode, we get subjected to these cringe-worthy monstrosities towards the end. Music videos that Jehovah's Witnesses are apparently supposed to not just look forward to, but play in their homes? <laughs> I mean, you tell me, Jehovah's Witnesses who are tuning in, what do you do with this? I mean, are you seriously, as a Jehovah's Witness married couple, supposed to put this on in the evening uh, just to spice things up a bit? <laughs> are you really going to be getting down to uh, this sort of thing? This for me, would be a mood killer more than anything. <laughs> because I'd just be in stitches, to be honest. I'd be too busy laughing to be thinking about um, anything romantic. Of course, this isn't the first time Jehovah's Witnesses have attempted to craft a love song. It's simple, so easy, and it's something we know with a threefold chord. Love will grow with Jehovah to guide us in all that we do. How I love to be truly in love with someone like you. Someone like you. Again, you tell me, Jehovah's Witness couples who are watching this, can you get down to this sort of thing? I really struggle to imagine it, quite frankly. It seems to me that the whole concept of romance, of romantic music in particular, got stuck somewhere between the 50s and the 70s. This sort of stuff that we've heard today was more, I would say, 50s, 60s. <laughs> the one we've just heard, the example I've just shown you, was more, I guess, 70s Barry White-ish. That's the sort of love song that Jehovah's Witnesses, provided, of course, there's a theocratic spin and Jehovah features prominently in the lyrics. That's the sort of genre that Jehovah's Witnesses or Jehovah's Witness couples, so long as they're heterosexual couples, we've learned in this episode, that's the sort of stuff they should be getting down to. Anyway, that's all I have for you. We have been reviewing the March 2021 JW Broadcasting episode hosted by John Ekron. What a monstrosity. Just endless misogyny and gender profiling and stereotypes. John Ekron just giving free reign to his personal opinions about what the roles of husbands are versus the roles of wives. Conveniently for him, 
Husbands are worthy of respect, whereas wives tend to place greater emphasis. That's the word. There's an emphasis on respect for men, conveniently for him, and an emphasis on love for wives, all based on his interpretation of Ephesians 5 verse 33. Do with that information as you will. Let me know in the comments what you've thought about this JW Broadcasting episode, but that's all I have for you. Don't forget to subscribe to the Lloyd Evans channel for more such videos, and as always, thank you for watching. Thank you.